Hi, this is Manos Pirlakis from the Minneapolis Hack Institute, presenting on fundamental concepts for CTO interventions. Unfortunately, there is not a single thing that, when applied, can achieve success in all cases. However, there are multiple principles that, consistently being applied, they can improve the success and the efficiency and the safety of the procedure. Many of those are outlined in Chapter 3 of the second edition of the Manual of CTO Interventions. The first one has to do with timing. In general, ad hoc CTO PCI should not be performed. That is, after diagnostic and geography, the patient should be taken off the table, and the CTO intervention should be rescheduled for a later day. Many reasons for this, the first one being that allows more time for the operator to plan the CTO procedure. More time to look at the angiograms, find previous films, and sometimes obtain a CT angiogram to better understand the anatomy of the occlusion. Second, reduces the patient's contrast and radiation dose. Third, allows both the patient and the operator to be well rested and ready for the procedure. Fourth, allows to check for viability and ischemia in some cases when the viability of the CTO supply territory is not very clear. And fifth, it provides enough time to explain the risks, benefits, goals, and alternatives of CTO PCI with the patient and the family and answer any questions that they may have. The second key principle is performing a dual injection. Dual injection means injecting both the occluded coronary artery as well as the contralateral donor vessel, which is either the contralateral coronary artery or a bypass graft. This technique, described 18 years ago, is key because it allows better understanding of the anatomy of the occlusion, namely where the occlusion starts, the occlusion length, the distal vessel, and the presence and extent of collaterals. Dual injections should be performed ideally at low magnifications so that there is no need for panning because the entire heart can be within the imaging territory. Then the donor vessel, in this case the left main, is injected first. A few seconds go by and then the CTO vessel is injected until the contrast clears, so then we can understand the proximal cap, distal cap, and occlusion length. Here's an example of how dual angiography can help not only in the beginning, but also during CTO PCI. In this particular right coronary artery CTO, the wire is subintimal, but is moving or dancing with the distal vessel. However, once the stingray balloon was advanced to attempt re-entry, on repeat contralateral injection, we now see that the balloon actually is not anymore into the distal RCA, but instead it's gone into a marginal branch. So by understanding this, the vessel was uh, rewired, and then the stingray balloon was delivered to the distal RCA, and then the contralateral injection allowed us to accurately place the stent to avoid jailing, to avoid jailing the bifurcation at the distal cap. And that provided um, a nice final result with TIMI3 flow in the right coronary artery. The third key concept is that of studying the lesion. It is very important to take the time to very carefully look at the diagnostic angiogram and understand the anatomy of the occlusion. We first start at the beginning of the occlusion, the proximal cap. And we look at how the proximal vessel is, is there disease proximally, calcification, how big is the proximal vessel? Is the proximal cap clear or is it ambiguous? Is it blunt or tapered, tapered being easier to cross? Are there any side branches next to the proximal cap that can sometimes make it difficult to cross the occlusion because the wires tended to enter there? And is there calcification which can make penetration sometimes difficult requiring very stiff penetrating guide wires? Second, we'll look at the lesion length and composition. Once again, is it a long occlusion or short occlusion? Is there calcification or tortuosity within the occlusion? Third, we'll look at the distal vessel, specifically at the caliber and quality. Is it a large vessel or a small diffusely diseased vessel? In general, the larger the vessel, the easier it is to recanalize. Is there a bifurcation close to the distal cap? Because if there is, we want to try to enter into the vessel proximal to the bifurcation to avoid losing one of the side branches? Are there any previous bypass graft insertion sites? 
which can sometimes tend the vessel or distort the anatomy, making it harder to cross through that area. And the fourth thing we want to look at is the presence of collaterals. Are they septal, bypass craft, or epicardial collaterals? The larger they are, the easier to cross. The same if they have less tortuosity. Also, it's important to know if they are dominant or not, because if there's only a single dominant collateral, crossing through the collateral can cause significant ischemia, leading to arrhythmias and hemodynamic collapse. And finally, we want to look at the angle and location of entry of the collateral vessel. The fourth component, or the fourth key principle, is to make a plan based on the view of the diagnostic angiogram. And there are different algorithms that can be used for that, such as the hybrid algorithm showed here. There's also the Asia-Pacific algorithm, and every operator can fine-tune or make adjustments to this algorithm. But in general, in, pa in patients who have ambiguous cap or small diffusely diseased distal vessels and have good collaterals, an upfront retrograde approach is a good choice. In other cases, undergrade is the way to go, with longer lesions favoring earlier use of undergrade sexual reentry and shorter lesions um, undergrade wiring. For every case, it's important to change between strategies if the initial strategy fails to achieve crossing. This is an example of a strategic plan. The four characteristics are written down, proximal cap, length, distal vessel, the presence of collaterals, and what are they, and then the plan. In this particular case, we're going to do first undergrade wires, then retrograde from the second septal, third retrograde from the, fourth, from the third septal, and the fourth option is to do undergrade resection reentry. A fifth key technique for doing CTO PCI, and I would argue doing complex PCI in general, is that of using the trapping technique. This is a technique that allows removal of over-the-wire equipment when used over short guide wires. This is an example of a microcatheter and a guide wire. The microcatheter is pulled back into the guide catheter, and then a balloon is advanced, not over the existing guide wire, but into the guide, not over the wire, and is advanced distal to the distal tip of the microcatheter. There are actually now some specialized trapping balloons, the trapper by Boston, that can uh, be inserted without um, using the guide wire. They don't have actually a guide wire lumen. And the balloon is inflated, effectively pinning the guide wire against the wall of the guide catheter. And by doing that, the microcatheter or anything else that is over the wire, over the wire balloon, for example, can be removed while the wire position is maintained. Once the removal of the microcatheter is completed, the trapping balloon is deflated and removed, and then, very importantly, the TUI is backbled to clear the guide of any air which is commonly aspirated when the trapping technique is being used. A sixth key principle for CTO and also for complex PCI is that of having strong guide catheter support. There are many ways to achieve that. One is by using the various anchoring techniques, such as a side branch anchor, or a coaxial anchor, or a distal anchor, by using larger guide catheters that provide more support, using uh, deep guide catheter engagement, using supportive saves such as the AL1 guide, and using guide catheter extensions. Being familiar with all those techniques can facilitate getting the support needed to cross CTOs and other complex lesions. Seventh key principle is to pay careful attention to the EKG and the pressure. This is not just for CTO PCI, but for any PCI, in fact, for any kind of coronary angiography or cardiac catheterization. The EKG is important to detect changes such as ST elevations in here. The same for the blood pressure to see signs that could suggest trouble, such as pulsus paradoxus, that can suggest tamponade. Eighth, it's very important to limit the radiation dose, and the reason for doing that is to reduce both the patient's and the operator's dose and the risk for skin injury for the patient. Very important to use low frame per aid. Don't use the pedal when you're not looking at the screen, so avoid the heavy foot syndrome. Position the image intensifier very close to the patient and the table as high as possible from the X-ray tube and use shielding as much as possible to minimize the operator dose. Ninth principle is to be ready to manage complications. 
CTO PCI carries similar complications than non CTO, but in increased frequency, and being able to deal with them, especially with perforations, is a key readiness parameter to facilitate success of the procedure. This is an example of the perforation algorithm. There's actually separate videos outlining treatment both of large vessel as well as distal vessel perforations. Being familiar with algorithms like this is critical so that therapy can happen very quickly if a complication happens. And the tenth principle is that of persistence. CTOPCI can sometimes be hard and may require a lot of efforts, different techniques, being creative, which also requires being humble and willing to learn because every case does have learning in it. So 10 fundamental principles for CTOPCI. First, don't do ad hoc procedures. Stop the procedure and bring the patient back at a later time. Second, dual injection. Third, study the angiogram for 10 to 15 minutes. Fourth, make a procedural plan, ideally in writing. Fifth, know how to use the trapping technique and use it for its changes. Sixth, get strong guy catheter support. Seven, before and after every injection and during the case, continuously monitor the EKG and the pressure tracings. Eighth, minimize the radiation and also the contrast. Ninth, be careful for the occurrence of complications and be ready to treatment if they occur. And ten, persist to achieve success. Thank you.